What's going on, YouTube? Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Texas Street Stories, where we talk about what happens on these Texas streets. And if you haven't already subscribed, help your boy out and hit the subscribe button. On today's episode, we're going to continue reading about Robert DeGallo, original Texas syndicate leader, was considered the number two in Texas at one time. Each morning, even, be even before the sun came up, except on Saturdays and Sundays, the BTs would be out in force, screaming, work time, work time, in the cell blocks, ready to beat down any stragglers. The building major, surrounded by his favorite building tenders, standing in the middle of the long courier, screaming racial epithets and profanities in the air at the, at the prisoners that ran by him in single file. Then the major, without warning, would step forward to take a swing at fist at, at someone's head because that someone forgot to remove his hat, his cap. That someone never stopped to look back to make it an issue. Don't stop to stare at the major either because he merely had to point his finger at you and his building tender dogs would be upon you. Deep in the thick woods, we would be assaulted by millions of mosquitoes swarming at us at the beginning of the task of assaulting the huge trees to clear plots of land. Armed with axes, we kept our eyes on anybody that came too close. This isn't the place where you have to disrespect someone to get killed. It's a place where someone might just kill for no reason whatsoever. Once a tree was down, we would attack it by dismembering its branches and turning it into a hipless corpse. The tree was now a log. We would then put down our axes and in unison, the 20 man squad would race the, the ton log on our bruised shoulders and rapidly heed to one of the several bonfires a few hundred yards away. In between the burning bonfires, the smoke would blind our path. The only indication that someone had fallen into the fire were the little mushroom clouds that kicked up ash. The burning victim, his face black from ash and his arms widely swinging at the orange flames clinging to his clothes, would rejoin us, still smoking. The hot Texas sun above us and the burning bonfires below soared the temperature to above 110 degrees. It was like a scene from hell, a lake of fire, smoke and misery. After a few weeks, the thick woods would be nothing but barren fields, ready for the aggie or hoe. The wooden handles, a rust color from fresh and old blood stains, from those bloody hands before ours. We would line up in a single file. The, the building tender Lee Row, work, worker at the beginning of the single file, and the building ten, tail, tail row working at the end. Everybody else packed in the middle. In unison and in total silence, we would bury the hose blade in the hard ground in front of us flat weeding anything that was in our path. The building tenders asking permission from the guard to touch, touch one up who couldn't keep up with the grueling pace. You see, inside, the building tenders didn't ask the guards for permission to do anything. They were the guards. But outside the security prison fence, the building tenders have to ask permission because their knives were in, weren't any match against the guards 357. And that was one authority that the building tenders didn't res did respect. Then on, on what seemed like a, a prearranged signal, they would hit you all at once. And it wasn't the building tenders this time either. It was the pesty fire ant. Quickly lifting up my pant leg, I would start picking off one by one the ants that were feasting on my leg. The ugly red welts on my legs indicated the number of bites that I had taken. Then from the clear blue skies, Above came the roar of a low-flying yellow plane, unleashing its wrath, a long white streak of outlaw herbicides and pesticides were sprayed all over the plants, the prisoners and unsuspecting field guards. The wild-eyed horses aggressively pounding their hoofs and snorting as they struggled with the reins to free themselves seemed, seemed to know something we did it. Underneath our blue and red bandanas, that covered our mouths, we did it. In noses, the white, the white rain fell on us as the place, the plane, and the fear in the far distance turned in the white arc to make another pass over us. Years later, 
we would suffer from symptoms similar to those suffered by soldiers who had come into contact with the Agent Orange in Vietnam, cancer, kidney damage, chest pains, and other ill side effects. Besides reducing the years that we would live, I would in the interim suffer from impotency, asthma, and blood poisoning. Every day coated with the layer of dirt that stuck to our sweat, we labored through choking clouds of red dust one day under a blazing Texas sun, then be slouching through ice and mud the next under a dark sky. I often made it an issue with the prisoners over the grueling pace. We weren't going to get paid for the work, nor were we going to be rewarded by letting out of work early. So what was the mad rush to finish? The answer was simple. The building tenders wanted to please their God in gray, and most prisoners wanted to keep their heads on their shoulders and stay out of solitary. We worked monetarily, basically, just to earn meals that could just could not sustain our health, like busy bees going about our task. The work squad, the work squads, had contributed to the good of the hive by bringing in food in abundance to the guards and the building table and the building tenders' table, only to find out they were not invited to the feast. The food that was rejected was fed to both the prisoner and the pigs. Welga. Work strike, I would say, instigating a few others to join me and refusing to work and in defiance, we would throw our, our agates to the ground. In an effort to intimidate us, the guards would ram the horses against our bodies. Failing to get the results they wanted, we, we would be told at a gunpoint to strip, strip down naked, and then the cattle drive would, would begin. As we would trod toward the building a good mile away, the horses like obedient dogs would reach out to bite those who weren't moving fast enough. At a distance, I could see a horde of building tenders standing at the prison, prison's back gate, ang ang anxiously waiting our arrival. The major telling the building tenders to leave me for last as, as he dis disappeared into his office. There I stood naked in the main courier wait, awaiting my turn to be called inside the major's office trying to visualize just what had happened. Muffled voices followed by a thud as someone was thrown up against the wall. It was good that I couldn't see the faces of the ones that were being beaten. While some walked out on their own, others were dragged out by their feet. It was not the beating that made me, that made me wiring my hands in anxiety, but the waiting. Beating blue, the administration thought that fear perhaps would replace our rebellious minds. The fear tactic failed. Those bucking the system like me that made a second, third, fourth, and more trips to solitary didn't care about the pleasing the God in gray and his building, ten building tenders, angels of death. Simply put, there are some people you just can't intimidate. Solitary served as an ugly memorial that kept reminding the prison administration that there was a few prisoners that would never be able to control and dominate. On and off, I would spend over three years in super segregation and solitary confinement for prison violations ranging from organizing work stoppages, conspiracy to murder, a prison guard, to stabbing building tenders. In solitary, it was like coming to life <clears throat> as a character in a Nintendo survival game. You daily have to resist the the, the devil's temptation of suicide by defeating loneliness, boredom, and madness. Death constantly pacing back and forth outside our cages, ready to collect the souls of those that failed the test. Crazy dog, they yelled as they slammed the great solid steel solitary sh door shut in my face, leaving me in total darkness for the thousandth time in that horrible place that knew no daylight. It was so dark that its shadows could be felt on your body like a heavy mist. So dark that it was like beating a thinking entity with no body. That horrible place filled my nostrils with the smell of human blood, urine, and death mingling together in the air from the bodies that were there before mine. That horrible place where I took out the cryptic notes out of the snicker bars that the sympathizers had sneaked into me and then sharing the sweet contents. I would tell my starving comrades, take a bite and pass it on. 
to the German guards, joy. We were the mirror like images of the unshavy bony and their, and their forefathers concentration death camps. That horrible place where we were stripped naked in the winter months and suffered from frostbite only to be feasted on at the turn of the season by those dreaded blood sucking mosquitoes. That sweat box that was so hot that I would moisten my dry cracked lips by kissing the sweat drops off my naked body or lap the drops of drip of water dripping from the leaky faucet with my tongue as a dog laps water. It was so hot that to control the hair, the heat rash covering my body, I often urinated on it, but I often had nothing to urinate either. That horrible place where the, where the hands of time had no hours, minutes, nor seconds. It was either dusk or dawn. The time told with the flapping of wings as the bats in the pipes chase flew away at dusk only to return at dawn. That horrible place where my heart skipped a beat or two at the sound of brass keys jingling in the keyhole, the creaking sound of a solitary door opening followed by the sounds of violence as the build, building tender janitors made their daily rounds. The horrible place where days of prolonged isolation turned into years of virtually no human contact because they said that my influence could corrupt other minds. How much more could I corrupt the criminal minds of murderers, rapists, and thieves? They kept me isolated so long that each time I was liberated into the general population, I stuttered from a lack of speaking. My only companions had been roaches, mosquitoes, bats, ants, spiders, birds, and rats. That horrible place where I could find no comfort in knowing that I was in the same cage where others before me in the spire had, had thrown up their hands towards the heavens before surrendering their spirits. They called solitary a place of meditation where convicts were left thinking about three ways, but it was a place of misery and death where few would lose their minds or lives. If, if, if solitary was horrible, how much worse must hell would be while lying, while laying on my concrete slab that served as my nest, I ran my dirty fingernails into a biblical verse. Someone before me had carved into the tombstone wall of my grave. A verse that I had carved into my memory through my blind fingers. <clears throat> Were all these things happening to me for some sort of religious endurance test for the fittest? I was the mage. I was amazed that such a biblical verse could have been written thousands of years before and still have sufficient meaning to this very day. Was it then that in bad times like this, that a man's character is put through a fairy trial and measured to what that he or she is made of, gold, silver, or straw? The only problem with, with this verse was that I sure wasn't a saint. Besides the psychological abuse there was the physical abuse. The guards were crushed the bones was within my flesh underneath their cow stinking cowboy boots over a half a dozen times. I counted the beatings to keep score. I couldn't hide my blood covered mask from them, but once I did give them the pleasure of showing them my pain, I hid from them. Instead, I laughed in their face in defiance, sticking out my tongue at them as if it was child play when the game was real and deadly. I knew deep down in their black hearts, they respected me, perhaps even feared me, but they would never admit it. To admit it, it would be a sign of weakness in a place where someone would take advantage of it. Like two dueling swordsmen, their snake-like blue eyes would lock with mine as they tore from the wall of my comrade's cell, the picture of the Virgin Mary. Dropping the pieces of torn paper on the floor as they slithered away from the cage, through their unblinking eyes, I have seen fermenting wine as the rage grew. They knew that they had failed time after time to crush what they called a rebellious spirit. <laughs>